Hey. That the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. So I will rejoice and be glad in it. Is there anybody in here this morning just glad to be in the presence of God? Amen. He's a good God and he's worthy of our praise. And we just want to give him that this morning. We're going to sing a couple of old songs. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. As I journey through this land, I'll be singing as I go. I will be pointing souls to Calvary to the crimson flow. And you know that many arrows pierce my soul from without within. Service for my Lord, oh, dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to Him, for He will give me life. And you know that saints and snakes may vex my soul and turn my thoughts aside. Father, in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for watching over us last night. Thank you for bringing us here to this place. Father, this moment, Father, we just ask, Father, that you intervene and come into this place, Father. Feel our spirits this, this, this morning, Father, and also be with your manservant as he brings the lesson on today. But Father, as we usher into this worship, Father, that we give you everything and we turn over everything to you. We release everything, Father, that's holding us, Father, and that's also bounding us at this time, Father, that we actually release those things, Father, and also know, Father, that you are our ultimate resource. 
and we lean on you at this time. Father, we know that, Father, we are sometimes weary. Sometimes we give up. We want to give up, Father, and we want to actually sometimes walk away from the faith. But we ask this time that as we worship, Father, we can also understand, Father, that you're always in the midst, Father, and you'll never leave us nor forsake us. But, Father, we just love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let us all say amen. Amen. got some more people coming in so we're gonna ask that y'all just get in tight and love each other so we can accommodate everybody that's joining us for worship today amen searched all over couldn't find nobody i looked high and low still couldn't find
Well, good morning, family. Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Hey. I'm sorry. Squirrel moment. I just, just saw something that I hadn't. See what we did. God is good. God is good. Um, anyway, Richard, focus. Uh, this, this morning, we're going to do things just a tad bit different. Um, offering. We're going to talk about the offering, then we'll do communion at the end of service, after the, after the sermon. So, let's talk about money, shall we? <laughs> um, so, with, the, with, with all that being said, all jokes aside, we are a very blessed, rich, in spirit, not just money, but no, in this spirit as well, a rich family here. God has blessed us with many things, and, um, now, and it's our not only, not only our right, but our obligation you know, to return back to what God has given to us. Uh, so as, as we think on those things at this time, let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Lord, our Father in heaven, Father, we thank you this morning for every soul that's represented here in this building, outside of this building, in cyberspace. Father, wherever you have allowed us reach, to touch. Father, we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the things that you bless us with, both physically and spiritually. Father, we, we pray that our hearts are open this morning. We pray, pray that things are, um, pray that our hearts are open, Father, pray that our hearts are clean, and Father, that, that we give as we have. Father, we ask that you will continue to, to bless the, the leadership here. Father's leadership um, determines how these funds are going to be used. But, Father, most of all, that in whatever way that we use it, that the glory belongs to you, that you get the glory that you deserve. And, Father, we just humbly want to say thank you again for blessing us as we return this back to you. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we ask it all. Amen. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keeps me in the valley, hides me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I am weak, and forever He will reign. My God is awesome. Provider, provider, 
serve a living God. We serve a God that's not dead, therefore we should not be a dead church. Because if we are living members of a living body, we should be alive through our worship. He's an awesome God and whatever you need him to be, that's what he'll be for you. They say he's a healer, a provider, a protector, a deliverer. But whenever I need him, I just call him Jesus. We can just call on the name of Jesus. When you need a friend, just call on the name of Jesus. Y'all singing like y'all came to have church this morning. Yeah, yeah, it feels like one of those old Sundays where everybody used to get in tight and just give God praise. How many had some trouble this week? Oh, everybody was living good. Nobody had no trouble this week. Well, I had some trouble, y'all, let me tell you. But I believe that Jesus will fix it. Do y'all believe that this morning? Trouble in my way, trouble in my way. I gotta cry sometimes. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I gotta cry sometimes. I have to cry sometimes. That's all right. That's all right. So 
Y'all all right this morning? Yeah. Now you probably will get some seats now that some of the children are going to children's church. Let's stand on our feet. We're going to get to the reading of. God's Word and all of these technical devices are acting up. I don't know what the devil is trying to do today, but he's trying to make sure that we don't share a word with you on today. Let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 17 through 34. says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order 
that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord that which I also was delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. neighbor, neighbor. Guess who's coming to dinner? Guess who's coming to dinner? Lord have mercy. Comparable to the 21st century, we know about Las Vegas. Many of us have been to Las Vegas. I said many of us. Y'all supposed to say amen. And it's a place where it seems that anything goes. It's a place where anything goes, or what they always say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Amen. But I want you to understand that Corinth was that kind of place. And when you look at the city of Corinth, it was established, and it had so much paganism going on in that particular city. Julius Caesar gave it specialized status as a retirement colony for soldiers somewhere around 44 B.C. And yet this historical context for Latinized cosmetology, cosmetology uh, Co Corinth was marked by so much diversity. If you would read up on some of the historical facts when it comes down to Corinth, you realize that Corinth had a lot of similarities with the United States of America. There were Egyptian and Syrian immigrants. There were freed slaves, manufacture of quality bronze and terracotta goods and, and temples, not only Greek gods, but they had that temple Aphrodite. In her case featured cultic prostitutes but also the Egyptian gods, such as Osiris, god of fertility and the dead, and Isis, and among these various cults that were in Corinth, Corinth with a new order based on what God has done in Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul arrives in this context around A.D. 51 and 52. Paul was initially drawn there because of his apostolic teaching. And that was the initial reason that he had come in. 
Uh, but, but I need you to understand that even in the city, you had many philosophers. They're preaching different various ideologies. And as a port city, he was also aware that it would be a great launching pad for future missionary journey. But that's the historical background of Corinth. But the main issue that's going on in our text this morning is that the assembly of the saints in Corinth in his social relationships was beginning to resemble the dominant culture in which Paul had come in. They had resembled that dominant imperial society to which it was supposed to be God's alternative to what, they, what was going on in the city of Corinth. The Corinthian church was fractured. It was divided. And that expressed itself in the abuse of the Lord's table. It appears that a group of well-off Corinthians would gather early and feast on the communion bread and wine. And look here, y'all. They had so much of a good time that they would get full and drunk. Y'all not hearing me. Paul, now church folk, Paul reminds them that the Lord's table is about the family of God. It's about fellowship with Jesus. And that this act is one that builds the love for God and his community. And in community, at the Lord's table, we express that we have all been redeemed by Jesus and we belong to Christ and belong to the body of Christ. But I need you to understand that this book came about because there were questions that the people in Corinth had. And Paul is going to address issues like abuse of spiritual gifts, uh, chaos in the worship gathering, and in the text this morning, disunity at the Lord's table. And to address this disunity and pride, Paul reminds them what the Lord's Supper represents and points them to a better way to worship together in community and communion. And I need you to understand that Paul said, first of all, what I'm going to teach you today, I didn't get it out of my own mind. He said it was handed down from Jesus who gave it to me. And the community has forgotten. And this is what Paul wanted to remind them. And this is what I want to remind us this morning, that the community has forgotten that they are celebrating, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper and is instead assembling uh, those people, instead of them celebrate, they were coming to eat their own meals. Can you imagine turning the Lord's Supper into a potluck meal? <laughs> but that's what they were doing in Corinth. And Paul is deeply concerned with what's going on. And to a certain extent, it could be understandable. You know how we are. We like to gather around people that's just like us. When you look at the society of Corinth, it was pluralistic and it was an economically desperate society. And you can understand they would separate itself into familiar groupings even while they were worshiping. For people are drawn to what they know. Yet Paul is pointing out they have become a degraded cockature of Christianity. For to dine alone at church means to decline to join with the church in this great expression of communion, of having something in common, of being a Christian and socialite, and it therefore manifest contempt for the whole assembly. I know y'all thought I was going to bury them and raise them up today. But verse 13 says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, listen to me, church, I hear Paul says that there are divisions among you. The first and only issue was what happened when they came together at church. This is the second time, y'all, that Paul says, when you come together, the phrase occurs five times in this text, and the Lord's Supper is to be observed when the church meets together. I need to help somebody today. It's a shared meal at the family table. It is not fast food through the drive through window. But it's when we come together. The only thing that I've never understood 
is how that we take up the offering every week, but we don't observe the communion in some churches every week. Can I get any help in here today? I mean, if we sing every week, if we pray every week, if we preach every week, y'all not hearing me? If, if we do all of those things every week, you would think it would be logical to believe that we would commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yet, we pick and choose on certain Sundays or certain months that we want to observe everything that we are about comes down to the resurrection comes down to the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I need to help you. There are dynamics of church life that cannot be reproduced virtually. The Lord's Supper is one of those dynamics. It is to be celebrated when the church meets together. Church refers to the assembly, not a location, not a building. The church is not a building, y'all. It's not made of the roof and the bricks and the mortar. It is the gathered assembly of redeemed people in Christ that must to not tolerate division. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. I ain't got time to really deal with that text because what a lot of us think that text means is we're supposed to be cookie-cutter Christians. I could really go to the Greek and help you to understand that that's not what it's talking about because all of these people in this room this morning got different personalities. Let me tell you something. When you're married to somebody, y'all don't think the same all the time. Uh, do I get an amen in there? You're going to disagree with your spouse at times. So what do you think when you bring people? To, it don't mean that you have to have the same opinion about everything. Paul's teaching is clearly designed to influence the reader as to how in their society of competing ideologies and all of this immorality that is insensitive to the poor, they are to properly observe the communion. Now, let me teach y'all. Let me tell you why it's important to teach this particular text. Is that in order for us to understand the intentions of Paul concerning our participation in the Lord's Supper, without projecting our own thoughts, our own opinions, our own preconceived belief systems into the results of this inquiry that we're looking at. It's important to note, very careful study of this passage to avoid any misunderstandings that ascribes to Paul what he never said or never meant. Preach on, Pfeiffer. Several church folks who have read this passage have felt the fear of participating in the Lord's Supper celebrations in the church. Having some of your great-grandparents and grandparents and parents scared you to death about taking the Lord's Supper and examining yourself before you take the Lord's Supper and refraining from certain things. I know some of you all may not raise your hand, may not say amen too loud, but some of you have come and you wondered about that. Am I worthy? Am I right? You'll never be worthy. I'll never be worthy. See, the text says unworthily manner. Is that in your Bible? Look in your Bible. Does it say anything about the worth of the individual? Or does it say partaking of it in an unworthy manner? What is that teaching you? It's teaching you that there's something that these folk were doing in Corinth that was disrespectful and sacrilegious when it came down to the communion. Guess who's coming to dinner? So the context will tell us that this unworthy manner looked like people being selfish. Communion in the ancient church was likely a large meal together, and it appears that some of the more well-to-do and well-off Christians would gather early and eat there until their bellies were full and they got drunk off of the communion wine. 
This is one of the reasons we know that it was a larger meal because it would take around 200 packs of communion supplies to fill your bellies. But Paul tells them that if their goal is to be filled up, they should eat at home. Paul says you got houses to eat in. But when you come to the assembly, there needs to be a respect that you have for this meal. Are y'all with me? Are y'all, y'all ain't left me yet, is it? This meal, church, represents Jesus' selfless love to reconcile the people to the Father. And here they are selfishly stuffing food in their mouths and creating division. This is one of the only places in the Bible where we read that God's people gathering was not for the better but for the worse. That should give us a clear understanding and a clue that something seriously dysfunctional was wrong when it came down to these people assembling. And Paul hints at two sides to the same problem, and each is called out by the words in your text, when you come together. The first aspect and the bigger issue is general disunity and factions. And the second aspect is the practical concern with how they were administering the communion. It appears that the division expressed in communion was also related to those who were well off and those who were poor because the poor were being humiliated. That's in verse number 22 of chapter 11. So the particular issue around the Lord's table is that a group would gather ahead of time and take their fill of the bread and the wine and leave the other folk out. Instead of building one another, the church was fractured and the church was selfish. Now, we might not be getting drunk off of communion wine, and we might not be getting full off of the communion bread, but we got some selfish folk in the church. that have their own agendas and have their own motives. And so he wasn't wanting to focus on their gluttony and their drunkenness. He's saying the Lord's Supper is designed for the church to express and sustain community with one another. In contemporary churches, we can often view the Lord's Supper through an individual lens of our own personal time with Jesus where we reflect upon our sin and and meditate on Christ, which is good, but what this passage communicates is something more of a corporate matter and not an individual matter. This text of Scripture shows how the Lord's Supper points to the church being shaped by the gospel. At the beginning of this letter, Paul asked the Corinthians to have the same language and to to avoid divisions, and he talks about how he got it. Now, let's go to the Bible here. It says, we should begin by noting in verses 23 and 24, the King James Version and the New King, King James Version have an expansion to the verse which reads, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. That's in the NKJV. Both phrases, take eat and which is broken for you, are found in several manuscripts, but not in the majority of old manuscripts or translations. Therefore, it is most likely that these phrases are not original, but added by a scribe during the transmission. We know from John chapter 19 and verse number 36 that Jesus' body was not broken. Brothers, we need to stop praying for the broken body of Jesus. Now, if you're talking about broken being figurative, that his body was broken under the scourging, under the excruciating pain, under the suffering, but the Bible says that not a bone in his body was broken. It's almost like we would use the the, the adage today to say, you know, I'm broke down. That don't mean that you just broke down. It just means you tired, you exhausted, you're worn out. So we need to recognize that his body did not experience broken bones. But if we say that Jesus' body was broken, we should mean regarding the treatment of his body. Teach, teach Pfeiffer. With that out of the way, let us consider what Jesus wanted us to remember. You need to understand. Notice that Jesus gave thanks. And this is why we pray. Before we partake of the bread in verse 24, the gospel of Matthew and Mark read that Jesus blessed the bread. 
Blessing the bread is the same as giving thanks. We do not need to pray in our prayer for God to bless this bread. We are blessing the bread when we're giving thanks. Blessing is the giving of thanks. We used to have this terminology even in our language. At dinner, you would ask someone to say the blessing, which meant to offer the prayer and thanksgiving to God for the food that is before you. Our prayer in the Lord's Supper as we prepare to take the bread is to be a prayer of thanksgiving. We don't bless nothing. It's already been blessed. Y'all ain't hearing me. We, we give thanks. Take the bread and eat in remembrance of Jesus. What are we to remember? Preacher, he said, this is my body, which is for you. We are remembering the sacrifice of Jesus that he made for us. His body, which is given for us, Isaiah's prophecy sums it up in Isaiah 53. But, oh, I got something for you. You gotta, can't just deal with the bread. You got to deal with the blood, right? Look what it says in verse 25. Paul says, in the same way, we took the cup. In the gospel accounts, church, we read Jesus giving thanks again before drinking. And this is why we give thanks before partaking of the fruit of the vine. Again, blessing the cup does not mean that we need God to bless it. Rather, we are giving thanks in the memorial. This also is to be done in remembrance of who? Jesus. So what are we supposed to remember, preacher? Often what we've done is remember the body Again, but this is not what Jesus says to remember. Listen to what Paul quotes Jesus saying. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is important that we do not shorthand this to understand what we are to remember. Often we will say that the cup represents the blood of Christ. Yes, that is true. So long as we understand the blood of Christ in a biblical way. We are not remembering the blood that came out of his side. Uh-oh. We're not remembering the blood that came from the crown of thorns or from his back. The bread represents the suffering of the body of Jesus. But what does Jesus say his blood represents? The new covenant? Are y'all in the text? That's what he says it represents. In fact, all the synoptic gospels read that this is the blood of the what? Covenant. The new covenant is what we are to remember. What does this mean? Why would his blood represent the new covenant? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 18, Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established, for a will takes a effect only at death, and since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive, therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. So the point is, covenant is not ratified without blood. A death must occur for a New Testament to be enacted. Your last will and testament will be enacted when you die. That's why people are always trying to figure out what happened to the thief on the cross. Well, Jesus can do what he wanted to do because he was still alive. Y'all ain't hearing me? He was still under the other dispensation. Y'all not hearing me? And so you, he, once he died and said, Father, I commend my spirit unto you. Once he did that, then when the spirit left his body, the new covenant was in force. I don't know about you today, but I'm happy that I'm not under the old covenant. I'm happy that I'm under the new covenant. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded to you for you. But I stopped by today that, to tell you that I'm glad that the blood of bullocks and goats and calves didn't wash away my sins. But the blood of Jesus in the new covenant has eradicated all of my sins. 
So how should we participate? You know, I had to build it up before I stepped on your toe. <laughs> when it comes to communion, we take communion in the context of the church service as followers of Jesus so that we can together express the gospel and fellowship in Christ. It is a reminder, church, that we are united in Christ and our new family in faith because of the work of Jesus. In communion, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, the broke and the folk that got money. Y'all ain't hearing me today. From all kinds of walks of life, point to the reason they're together, which is Jesus' substitutionary death, whom when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again, and we express our fellowship with him. Don't you know that when we commune, we preach a sermon? When we take the communion, we are proclaiming, we are preaching. We are saying to the world that we cannot wait till Jesus comes back again. That's why you can put a fence around the communion table. Those who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you don't need to partake of the communion because you got to believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ, that he died, that he was buried, and that he got up again. If you don't believe that he's coming back again, you don't need to partake of the communion because every time we partake of it, we are preaching a sermon to the world and say, we can't wait till Jesus comes back again. We proclaim that the Lord died, we proclaim how the Lord died, and we proclaim why the Lord died. The community celebration that the Corinthians are disregarding through their individualistic observances was bought and paid for by the life of Christ. And regardless of their inclinations, at the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the dignity of the sacrifice demands that his faith community at least properly celebrate it in communion. Y'all want to know what it means to take it unworthily? The context is the disrespect that some believers are showing their brothers and sisters in Christ. That disrespect is carried over into the sacrament itself because they are showing it at the very table of the Lord. See, what he's saying is when you come to this table, you better have those issues ironed out with your brothers and sisters. Because if you don't have those issues ironed out between your brothers and sisters, he's saying you taking that communion at your own risk. Because you are partaking of a meal that spells out unity, that spells out commonality, that spells out coming together. He said, how dare you take of a meal that means that you should be together, but y'all divided. So he says, when you take this in an unworthy manner, he ain't talking about your past sins. We should every day be examining our past sins. What he's telling you to examine is, are you getting along with folk in the body? Uh-oh, it's quiet in here. It's, it's quiet. The sacredness has departed the tradition of abusing the Lord's table. Folks, that's very serious. Don't you know how serious it was that people were dying? They were coming together for selfish reasons, and some supposed divine judgment has come upon, but upon believers who did not properly examine themselves, searching out and confessing their sins when it came down to their brothers and sisters in Christ. So what constitutes a word that observe? Remembrance of Jesus Christ? Do this in remembrance of me, proclaiming the Lord's death. But an unworthy man is, again, to partake of the sacred meal as though eating a common meal or a snack, in our case. Here it is. You know what? This is a phrase, y'all, 
Can I go to school with y'all as I wrap this up? This is a phrase in 1 Corinthians 11 that we read and we go past it real fast. Discerning the Lord's body. The participant needs to examine if he or she is discerning the Lord's body. Is that in your Bible? What does that mean? We may be inclined to consider these infractions that Paul reports to as occurring at the congregation of meals as a minor thing. We may not look at that as being serious, but after all, offenses are bound to occur. We talked about that last week. Is that not just a part of life to be offended? How many of you got offended this week? How many of you got offended on your way here? Lord have mercy. But in Paul's mind, what was happening within that congregation was not an insignificant thing. Which is why he writes in verse 29, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment. Is that in your Bible? To himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now I'm going to help y'all right up in here. All you SIS students, y'all better pay attention right through here. Many Bibles, marginal references for this verse, as well as some interlinear Bibles, indicate that the translators have added the word Lord to the text. Assuming that Paul refers to Christ as human body, however, in the Greek text, the end of the verse simply reads, not discerning the body. Hmm. The words, the body, can refer to several things that are not mutually exclusive. Paul could weave multiple threads through his writings and times, and, 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 and times overlap them in many profound ways. First, remember that some members in Corinth were confused about whether the congregational meals were at the Lord's Supper. But I need to help you understand that the body here can refer, and he is referring to the spiritual body of believers, the church. As we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 16, and 17, what we partake of is what we become a part of. Let me say that again. What we partake of is what we become a part of. When we partake of the bread that symbolizes his body, we become a part of the spiritual body of believers who are also in Christ Jesus and have the Father and the Son dwelling in them. In light of this in the text, what does it mean to discern the body? The English word discern means to separate or distinguish by the eye or by the understanding or see the differences between two or more things. It can mean to judge or even to be partial to. The Greek word here in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, 29, diakrino means essentially the same thing, to make a separation or a distinction or to evaluate between two or more things and become partial to one. It can mean to differentiate and it can mean to decide. A clear example of this word is in Acts chapter 15. 89, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and make no distinction, there go that word, between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. In his experience with the house of Cornelius, the apostle Peter declares that God did not make a dire cry known. He did not make a discernment between the Jews and the Gentiles. He gave the new Gentile believers the Holy Spirit just as he did the Jewish believers. God does not discern or make a distinction between believers based on ethnicity. God's distinction or discernment concerns only whether they are believers. Since the Gentiles were believers, he acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit. So what 1 Corinthians 11, 29 means then is that if we do not discern or make a correct distinction regarding the spiritual body, the person sitting next to you, we will partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. 
Mm. The way that we discern the body is to distinguish it in our minds from what is not part of the body. What you're saying, what you're saying, Willis? And the rest of you, man. It means to show partiality to the body as a whole. Rather than making distinctions within the body, the Corinthians were making distinctions among people within the body. The discernment that we should make is that we're all believers opposed to being in the world. That's the discerning we need to be doing. But what they were doing was breaking off into cliques. Breaking off into factions. Preach on, Fife. It's going to get quiet up in here. It's already quiet, but you're going to hear just a cricket in a minute. The Corinthians were making distinctions about people who were in, within the body, and thus they highly esteemed some individuals among them and despised others. Paul warns them that when it came time to observe the Lord's Supper, they were in danger of eating and drinking judgment to themselves because they were not being partial to Christ's spiritual body as a whole. Put another way, they were not treating all church members, all the brethren for whom Christ died, with the same respect. Let me tell you something. I already know there are going to be people in the body of Christ we ain't going to like. Amen? Amen? But that's what you need to examine before you take the communion. What's the, what, what, is, what am I supposed to examine, preacher? Is it, is it to look at my sin in my life? We should always do that. Every day we get up, we ought to be looking at our sins. We shouldn't wait till we get ready to take the communion to decide, on oh, am I right with God or not? This examination gives him freedom to partake of the sacrament without inviting judge. How many of us, we don't want bring judgment upon ourselves? For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. To make this practical, consider the principle of valuation. And I'm closing. In the world, an object's value is primarily determined by what someone is willing to pay for. An artist may claim his painting is worth a million dollars. But the actual monetary value comes when someone pays for it. Let me, let me say that again. Yeah, in the world, an object's value is primarily determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. You can think your painting is worth a million dollars, but the actual monetary value comes when someone gives you something for that painting. So in fine art, in furniture, and other expensive collectibles, records show how much is sold to gauge the, the value. We need to think about ourselves for a moment. Consider the value that we have as individuals based on what the Father and the Son together were willing to pay for us. Reflect on the incomparable worth of the blood of the perfect, unblameless, sinless Son of God. Ponder the Creator's supreme act of condescension in donning the form of a flesh and blood human and then giving their life as a ransom as a payment rather than allowing us to receive the wages of sin he paid the debt with a currency impossible for a human to access which gives us some idea of our value to God next we should apply this same incomparable value to someone else in the body with whom we feel close connection, perhaps a spouse, 
or a sibling or a good friend. God paid the same price for him or her because that individual incurred the same debt. Consider the value the father and the son now place on him or her based on what they were willing to pay. Finally, we must take this exercise one step further. Perhaps there is some part of the body, maybe someone in our own congregation, whom we know we should love, but don't like very much. Consider the value we place on him or her. Then think about the price the father and the son already paid for that person. How does our valuation compare with God's? Or is it more comfortable to regard some as outside the body than to be partial to them? By not discerning the body of Christ correctly, that, that, that is, by esteeming some members and despising others. The Corinthians were in fact signifying that Christ's blood, the life of the very creator, was worth more when it came to some folk. But not everybody. So Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29, if they were not properly discerning the whole body in their conduct throughout the year, they stood in grave danger because they would be unable to value and appreciate Christ's sacrifice in their fellowship with him through the Passover of the Lord's Supper. In not recognizing the God-given and inestimable, uh, in, uh, no, no estimate worth of all the others in Christ. That's the only amen I'm going to get. <laughs> Paul had written just a few chapters before, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, your sin, you sin against Christ. Let's put it together and close it out. You Corinthians have been behaving so poorly at the Lord's table that you are treating the brethren who are lower socially as second-class citizens of God's kingdom at the very meal intended to show equality and unity. Evidently, you have lost the significance of the Lord's Supper. Remember what it's about. The bread and cup represent the body and blood of our Lord, the new covenant, the sacrament, and the Lord's Supper is the time to remember Christ's death and the new covenant to be made that made for you. It is time to acknowledge that his body was given for us all and it should unite us all. Maybe you understand it this way. How many of you grew up in homes where you had the grown-up table (laughs) and the kiddie table? (laughs) Why did they have the grown-up table and the kiddie table? I knew when I walked in a room and saw the little short table in the corner. That was the kiddie table. That was the table for the kids to sit at. Because kids, they weren't supposed to be at the grown folk table. Because there was going to be some conversations and stuff going on at the grown folks table that the children didn't need to hear. Come a little closer. Let me make it a little spiritual here for you. Some of us need to get from the kiddie table and step up to the grown folk table. Because some of us, when we come together to commune, we still at the kiddie table, and God is saying, when you going to get up from the kiddie table and get to the grown-up table? Now, I need, I, need to, I need to help you to understand that this thing was so... I want to tell you how serious this was. The judgment against folk not waiting on one another at the table was more severely than incest and sexual immorality in the text. Mm-hmm. 
you better look in that text. There was some type of plague that hit the city of Corinth, and we don't know what it was. Maybe it was by coincidence, but a number of the believers took ill. They got sick. Some even died. Whatever the case, Paul is acting as a prophet and interpreting the significance of the deaths. They are the lowest means of disciplined believers. Note that the judgment serves to both discipline and protect. Their very deaths prevented them from falling into apostasy and being condemned. Furthermore, their deaths serve to warn the rest of the church to repent. If we judge ourselves truly, if they would examine themselves honestly, they would avoid their sin and judgment. Y'all remember Ananias and Sapphira? The point of that was to tell the church, don't play with me. Do not play with me. Can you imagine this? A church with as many problems as the Corinthian assembly is not as severely disciplined by God for incest and immorality as for failing to wait for someone to arrive at the supper table before eating. How could this be? Because failure to rightly appreciate and include members of the community is a failure to discern the body. And Paul is even equating physical problems and death to the body being violated by Corinthian ambivalence and neglect. Why was these Christians conduct this way and so offensive to God? God cares about relationships in the church. I know y'all glad I'm off of empathy and going to another pillar next week. Here's the invitation. When you get ready to take this bread and take this cup, Sometimes you don't need to be looking at what you did, but what you did to somebody else. Before, because see, this is what we do, and this is what has messed us up in the church. We love to move from the text and run straight to application. We must stay with observing what the text was addressing for its original audience. Many erroneous teachings have come from within the church and out of the church because we want to run to application without dealing with the text in its context. And you got folk running around here thinking, I got to be worthy. Sister, brother, you better go and take that bread and take that cup. Don't let folks scare you with, into the fact that I got to be, I got to, I can't have no sin in my life. No, what you can't do is not get along with folk. Sometimes we don't need to come down the aisle. We need to go cross the aisle. The reason why I preached this pillar starting off is because I saw the growth of this church. You don't be in ministry for over 35 years and don't know suntan folk. Whenever you bring different personalities, different belief systems, different gifts, different talents and bring them together, the devil is going to say, I'm going to make y'all act a fool. <laughs> There's a movie. I can't remember the name of it. Y'all will help me. 
but there's a devil, a man, an old man that comes to town. And he comes to town in a car. Needful things. And he sets up a shop in the community. And he puts his signs up and he's open for business. And everybody that comes in the store, everything in the store is what their flesh and heart desires. And when they walk in the store, they pick up items and he says, that's not going to cost you anything. He told the little boy that had a baseball, he loved baseball, and he gave him some cards. And he said, you don't owe me anything. But I might need something from you later. And there were two women in the community that didn't get along with each other. And everybody in the community knew it. And one of the women had apples in her backyard. And one of the women had a rock wilder that she loved dearly. The old man went to the young man. He said, you remember those cards you got from me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He said, I'm going to call in that favor. You love baseball, don't you? He said, yeah, I love baseball. He said, well, let me teach you how to practice your pitching. He said, go in Miss So-and-So's yard and pick a barrel, a basket of apples. And what I want you to do is throw those apples through the window. So what do you think when the woman came home and saw the apples all around in her house on the floor and her window shattered? The first thing she said is, that woman I don't like. She did this. And you know what that woman did? She went into that woman's house while she was not there and stabbed her rock wilder to death. And at the end of the movie, the sheriff is screaming. And he says, don't you know who he is? Don't you know who he is? You got the Baptist preacher and the Catholic priest cussing each other and fighting. The whole community is in chaos, and the devil is sitting there laughing. That's what he does to churches around America every day. While you're fighting and devouring one another, the devil has pulled into town, and he's sitting there laughing at us, act a fool with each other. Let me tell you something. Whenever God has a high calling on your life, whenever God has something for you, he will use the enemy to distract you. I need Central Rock to understand if this church is going to be what the church needs to be, Paul said, your enemy... Is not flesh and blood. Your enemy does not have a heartbeat in their chest, but your enemy is something from the principalities and a higher power that's working through folks. I know this wasn't a shouting sermon. I know it wasn't running around the chairs and shouting and all of that. But I would rather you not run around and shout and get your life together today. If you need Christ today, here's the invitation. You can come today. Don't worry about these folk in here. Oh, there's too many folk in this little room. I don't want to come down. If you need Christ today and you need to make him the captain of your ship, if you need to make him the author and finisher of your faith, then you come today and you can put him on in baptism if you hadn't. And let him be the leader of your life. But I need to help you with something. Just because you come to Christ don't mean that hell ain't fixing to break loose. 
Because I know you, you've been thinking, man, if I just give my life over to God, I'm going to get a job. All my troubles going to be over. And soon as you put them on in baptism, you get laid off. <laughs> Run out of gas on the freeway, Chris. <laughs> I just can't get a break. Got to change your flat. I can't, just can't get a break. Because in your mind, you think that when I came to Christ, all bad stuff stopped happening. Yeah. The Bible said when Jesus was baptized for an example, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. But if you ain't got nothing in you, if you ain't got no word in you, you ain't going to survive the testing. You say, well, I, I, I don't need Christ, but if you do, you can come today. Well, maybe you need change. It's hard to change old habits. It's hard to change old things that we have going on with us. We all have been living long enough to have pet peeves and certain things that get on our last nerve. And don't you know the enemy knows everything that get on your last nerves? And he'll put somebody on demonic assignment to get on your last nerve. Because all he wants you to do is forget about what this is about. If you need change to then say, I need to get my life together. Maybe, maybe you don't need to come down here. Maybe you need to pick up the phone. Say, brother so-and-so, can we meet for lunch? Sister so-and-so, can we sit down for breakfast? We need to talk. But see, that takes too much energy. But here's what the devil going to tell you. They ain't going to answer the phone. <laughs> ain't no sense in you calling. As soon as they see your call or your name pop up, they ain't going to answer the phone. Well, keep calling till they answer. If they don't answer, send a text. And you know when they read it. If they still won't answer, send them a letter, send them an email, because your soul is too valuable to go to hell over the individual. So if you're here today, why don't you come? Why don't you come today? Surrender. Why don't you come? Why don't you stand? If you're looking for a church, you don't need Christ. You don't need change, but you need a church. You can come today. We're not perfect over here, but we're striving. We're striving to be like him. Nobody in here got it all together. But we're striving to be like him. Care about your brother and sister in Christ. Why don't you come? Stop fighting it. Stop fighting it. And surrender. know what you're remembering. I need you to know that he died for you, but he died for the person next to you. He died for the person behind you. He died for the person in front of you. He died for everybody in this room. He died for the unlovable. He died for the unlikable. He died for those who are poor. He died for those who are rich. He died for those who are black. He died for those who are white. He died.
died for every ethnicity. He died for every nationality. He died for everyone who's in a lost condition. He died for you. You have value. So do let anybody tell you you don't have value. He loved you enough to give his life for you.
Does everyone have a cup? Make sure you have one. If you don't have one, the, the young men walking down the aisles will assist you. I won't take long. There's not a whole lot that you can really say after this lesson that you just heard, dealing with the communion, God's sacrifice, and, every, and everything that goes along with it. So with that, I think I see a couple of hands over here. Got one on the stage. So fam, if you, if you would, let's go to God in prayer right now and thank you. Lord, our Father in heaven, Father, after everything that we just witnessed, all we can do at this time is just say thank you. Father, thank you for opening up our eyes, Father, to see what really went behind that sacrifice. Father, thank you for the, for the understanding. Father, now we, we know we understand, rather, Father, that the blood of sheep and goats could not save us. It is only through your love and through the, the love of your son and his sacrifice that this was able to come together. We thank you, Lord, for being a healer. We thank you, Lord, for being a provider, a teacher, an example. But most of all, Father, we thank you for opening and making the way for us to be united through your son in that sacrifice. And it's in the name of Jesus that we offer up this prayer and give you thanks. Amen. As you continue to take your communion, let us also remember we're praying for those who have come forward. We also remember our preacher in, in our prayer. His statement on last week still resonates in our hearts and our minds. And we're going to pray for him to rest and just get himself to where he needs to be in order to lead our flock. With that, let's give him a love deposit. We have a few that have come forward. Sister Hillman. Sister Hillman writes that uh, she's asking for prayer for her aunt Norma Cox, that the Lord would give her strength to be able to take care of her husband. And she's asking for prayer for herself and a friend uh, that they can endure a little ache and pain because of a head-on collision. <laughs> Sister Lena, she comes, she's for prayers for her son, Jamarian Faulkner, who was in an accident this week, uh, he told his vehicle, uh, said that he walked away with minor injuries. Uh, he's depressed and needs your prayers. Just continue to pray for her family. And also she's asking special prayer for Mary Lowe. Uh, she's having some heart issues and needs prayer as well. Sister Bradford. Sister Bradford writes, I'm holding on to some things for the sake of my children. They've asked me to keep it to myself. It's hard because as a mother, your instincts are always to defend your children. I'm asking for prayer, for peace, to 
let it go and let God handle it. I also am asking for prayer for forgiveness for what I cannot forget. It's also weighing heavy on my heart, so please pray that the Lord will release this heaviness. We have two cars here. Tamika Patrick, Tamara Patrick, Patrick, that's my sis. Uh, she's requesting prayers for someone else. And I would like to have my membership identified with the Central Rock Congregation. Pray for Eric. He was involved in a motorcycle accident and suffered a broken leg and ankle. Uh, he will be having surgery on Tuesday to pray that the surgery will go well and he receive a speedy recovery. Amen. Amen. Yeah, she's not coming alone. Brother Eric will be with her, and we're glad to have that family, and let's make sure uh, that we keep him in our prayer for the upcoming surgery that he has on Tuesday. Uh, then we have a Stephanie Billings, and she says that she would like to have her membership identified with the Central Rock Congregation. Uh, She says that I need to be rebaptized today. And so we're going to let um, Brother Bradford at the right time, at the appropriate time, to take her confession. Uh, and she also has a prayer request. My 11 year old nephew shot his dad this week. His dad is on a ventilator, and I need prayer. Please pray for me and my family. He absolutely would do that. Uh, at this time, you might take her for confession at this time or uh, Miss Billings so she can be, prepare her for baptism. And if you don't want to do it, I'm not, uh, I, I can do it right now. And since I'm already up here, uh, not that you don't want to do it, but since I'm up here and I'm talking, Stephanie, would you stand, please? I'm going to ask you a very serious question. Today, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. No. Yes. You fine? Yes. Yeah. You just knew. You just, you just fine. You fine. She said yes. And I know you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This death brought, uh, confession brought death to him. But it's going to give you an opportunity to be rededicated to him and wash away your sins on the day. And I just want you to know that it took a lot of courage to do this today. Amen. But we want to continue to pray for you. We're going to continue to pray for your nephew, continue to pray for his dad. But at this time, we will go ahead and prepare her for uh, baptism. If you have some sisters to lead her to the back uh, and prepare her for baptism on today. That's At this time, we're going to prepare for the prayer circle. We're going to ask any of those who want to come down front uh, and to join hands and be a part of this prayer circle, you can do that on today. You may not have stood, uh, but it doesn't mean that you might not need prayer. And so we're inviting all of those who would like to participate and come down today uh, and be a part of this prayer circle. We invite you to do that right now. Amen. Can't get enough of prayer. Remember Louise Ford, uh, she mentioned a situation she got involved with on last week, and we're glad that God has kept her. Also pray for Sister Watkins. Got a chance to see her on yesterday. Uh, her spirits were better. Make sure that you keep her in your prayer as well. And Sister Raquel Watkins as well. She's at home not feeling well. Okay, 
Yes, Lakia, we don't want to forget little sis. Lakia's not here. Let's keep praying for her and her family. Right, if you don't mind, let me pray today. Let's, let's, let's bow. Father, we come at this time and we're just so, so thankful. Father, we love you so much. And Father, we know that through your word you've taught us that, Father, you gave up so much for us. I'm so thankful for Jesus and his death and his sacrifice and his life. We talk about his death and we talk about the resurrection. Those are important. Father, we want to thank, for, thank you for his life. Because, Father, he exemplified what it was of yours. And we're so thankful that he was able to be tempted in every way that we're tempted. And yet he didn't fall to sin. And he made it possible to be our scapegoat. And we're so thankful that he took on the sins, all of our sins. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit and the role that he plays in our, the believer's life. We're thankful, Father, how he comforts us, how he comes beside us. And Father, we pray that it's the sister who mentioned this tragedy in her family. Father, we just pray that you will be with Stephanie, be with her nephew. Father, that young man is going to be facing so much such a young age. But Father, we pray that even in these situations, we don't know all the details. We don't know all the things. Help us not to judge, but just to pray. To be thankful, and we're praying for that Father to be able to live through this and make it through this incident, who's fighting for his life. Father, we don't want two lives to be lost and two lives to just fade. But we're praying, Father, that you can bring some type of healing to that family. We pray that you would be with Sister Ford. We're thankful that you spared her through that unfortunate, unfortunate uh, accident that happened on last time that she was in surgery. But, Father, we know that it was you that spared her. You woke her up, and we're thankful. Father, help us, help her, because now she's going to be challenged with that. When you, when you experience something like that, Father, you don't forget it. But help her to know that you've, you've got her. We pray, Father, that you would be with Lakia and be with her and her husband and be with her children and her family as they, she heals at home and all the stuff that she's had the entire family to go through and encounter. Father, be with them. Bless them. Look down on them in a special way. Help them to know, Father, you're still there. You haven't abandoned them not one moment. We pray, Father, that you would be with Sister Bradford. We thank you, Father, for her courage. Father, it's hard to stand before people and discuss such matters. But, Father, we thank you for her courage. We, we thank you for her transparency and her honesty. And, Father, she wants your forgiveness. She wants the family to pray with her. We pray with her as we come to you asking for you to help her to let go and, and let God, let go and trust in you that she will not allow this situation, Father, to block her blessings. But Father, we pray that you will continue to strengthen her, continue to mold her and, and help this Father to make her stronger Christian in the future and present than she's been in the past. Father, we pray that you be with Eric. Father, we're thankful. Materialistic things we can get back. We can buy another car. We can buy another house. We can buy more clothes. But Father, life is something we can't get again. And we're thankful that you spared him. Yes, he's hurting. Yes, he's going through some brokenness in his body. But Father, we are so thankful that you spared him, that you allowed him to still be here. And we're asking, Father, that you be with Tamara as well as she's there to help and encourage him. We thank you for her being a part of our family. We pray, Father, that you will bless the surgery that he goes into Tuesday, Tuesday, that it goes well, and that you allow his body to heal. Be with every person, Father, who made prayer requests today, who've come today that I may not have remembered. Father, you know it's not my heart. It's just human. human. We don't remember everything, Father, but we know that you have heard their cry. You've heard their requests. 
You've heard everything that they want. We just want you to cover whatever their request may have been. That, Father, you divinely intervene in their lives and give them the things that they need. Be with every family. Be with this Central Rock family. Be with those that are extensions of this family, whether it be our physical siblings or our spiritual siblings. Father, help bring unity among your people. Help us, Father, to love you more than our own agenda. Love you more than our feelings and our motives and the thing in our flesh, but that we always do what's best for you and for each other. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. Continue to watch over us and guide us through the rest of this day in our life. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Ear to ear. Okay. Okay. And your grandson, look. <laughs> she said, let me get it in. So glad. Jasmine, good to see you. Robin, good to see y'all. Glad to have y'all with us today. Huh? Well, I mean, we have another one. Yeah, we have another Jasmine. Right. Yes. It was good to see him, too. All right. Glad to have you, Courtney. All right. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Well, we're glad to have you. Okay. Glad to have y'all. Glad to have you. They say, don't be putting us on front street. <laughs> you can just wave your hand. That's okay. They just want to acknowledge you, and we're glad to have you with us today. Have any on my left? I have a son, and my daughter is about Okay. My son, Shelton, a lot of you know, Shelton, Okay. All right. Four grandbabies, okay. 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 
Okay, 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 okay. We're glad, glad to have you. We said, I came here before. We're glad to have you. And I want to acknowledge Ashley and Chris Collins. I see Chris coming back in with the baby. And uh, it's just a wonderful joy. I want to thank them for coming and being with us today. It's really good to see you all. Okay, well, let me just say thank you to all of the community, those that have come out of the community to be with us, whether it be an overflow uh, in here. We've really been working hard to minister to this community, and we're thankful for their presence on today. God bless you. If you're seeing me out there in the overflow, we're thankful for having you. Okay. Okay, I don't know if we're going to wait 20 minutes. I miss what y'all are saying. Look here, let me, that's going to work. Let me tell you why that's going to work. And we'll be able to, to welcome our new uh, sister in Christ. And I know some of y'all don't want to get to that meal. But if you can stick around, we have some young people uh, that's going to come in and make a presentation. Uh, Brother Brandon told me, he said, look, if they're ready, uh, we're going to allow them to come in and do their presentation. If they're not ready, we're not going to do it. But I think they're ready uh, because he says that it's a goal. So encourage our young people uh, when they come in to do that. Do, uh, when, when will they be ready? They're ready now? Let's, let's bring our young people in and, and let's, let's, let's welcome them. Uh, we've been working hard with our young people, the children's church and the nursery. And... Let's be excited. But look at that. They just look so Easter. Look at y'all. Y'all just, look at these cuties up here. All right. They got the handsome young man. Look at that. Boy, I tell you, look at this. Look at this. You know, young folk, they don't, they don't say much anymore, so we're going to take this as an opportunity. Look at this. Look at this. They have really been working hard with the children in the children's church. Uh, we get a chance to, to bless them. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited about this. So our young people have really been doing some, some work, y'all. I mean, they have really been focused on understanding what Jesus and what he did for them in their everyday lives. They are so, so, so intelligent. The empathy is what we've been focusing in class as well for this whole quarter. Um, and they have really shown that they, they're ready to show you guys, you all, what empathy means to them as well. So I'll ask them a few questions. This is for our little ones. Um, and I'm going to ask, Sister Elena, what, what is... I'm going to ask you something in one second, okay? Because I'm changing that. What does empathy mean to you? Anybody? What does empathy mean? Somebody else's shoes. I'm giving them an opportunity. What, what, what does empathy mean? It means being nice. It is. It does. So what have we been studying on as well? The fruit of the what? Showing? Spirit. Wow. Kindness. Okay. Right. So what, what book, chapter, and verse is that located? Yeah, you, what is it? Is it Galilee? Who is it? Who is it? Who want to say Galatians chapter 5, 22. Good job. 22, 22 and 23. And we are going to, huh? 
So let me ask you, let me ask you another question. Who can answer? I'm going to go down. Who can answer all of the fruit of the Spirit? Who, who, what, what are they? What are they? I'm, I'm going to give you a chance now. You, you ready? Yeah. Okay, what's the first one? The first, the first one is that Jesus prayed for himself. All right, okay. All right. so you ready? Yeah. Let's go. He died for us. Okay, and what is the fruit of the Spirit, though? Love. Love. Kindness. Okay. Wait. I'm going to let my older ones come here, too, because they've been in this, so they better get this right. <laughs> All right? Older ones, what is it? Love. Joy. Okay. Peace. Patience. Faith. Self-control. <laughs> kindness. <laughs> kindness. <laughs> now y'all gonna make me. Long suffering. Is it goodness? Goodness. Uh-huh. Don't worry about it. We're gonna get them. So that's. My, yeah. Uh, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna transition. And the little ones are going to start off, and they have a song for you, for you all today. They're going to sing this song. And so, they're ready. Gabby, come on, Gabby. These are, these are the ones that's going to push it. They got the vocals. So, y'all, y'all come along with them, okay? Y'all come along with them. Uh, Caleb. Brandon, that's my, he, 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 he want to be Brandon today. Where is he at? Come here, Caleb. Don't be nervous now. Oh, no. Okay, okay. Here we go. Y'all ready? Here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Esther, Young Love, Solomon, David, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Job, Good job, good job. That takes a lot of confidence to be in front of y'all to say that. So I, I think we have the baptism that's ready, so we're going to take a pause, let the baptism be done, and then we're going to have the older uh, young people come up. Congratulations to our new babe in Christ. Yes. So we're going to let our older ones come up. We have Autumn, Braley, Aubrey, Brayla, 
and they're going to put on a, and who else do we got? Was there? No. Jaden, where, where did he hide at? My boys are hiding on me today. Where are they hiding? <laughs> and, 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 they're, and they're good at it. That's, where is Jaden? I'm going to get him. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to get started. Can y'all come on over so we can move? We got a long day ahead, so let's, let's go. Let's go. My workers, they got to get outside and get y'all ready. So let's go. All right, here we go. So they're going to be doing the New and the Old Testament. They're, they, I mean, they are excellent at it, so I look forward to them doing a great job. They're going to stand in front of you. They, they don't, they're not getting no help. Y'all don't help them. They're going to get this because at the end of the year, they said they're going to do it backwards as well. So reverse. Uh, so let's, let's, let's watch them. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the letters to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. Good job. Stay right here. Good job. They are, they are on it. If y'all are looking for a youth department, I'm going to tell you, this is a youth department. I ain't doing nothing. They are already smart, so, you know. <laughs> no, uh, what are we going to do? I'm going to ask him a question. Braley, what does Easter mean to you? Um, Easter means that Jesus, he died for our sins so that we can live eternal life with him. Yeah, Aubrey, you too. You're next. Uh, Easter means that he died for us, for our sins, and went through all that trouble so that, like, he could, uh, so, <laughs> uh, he came back to life for us, and yeah. 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 Are you? <laughs> <laughs> same thing, same thing. No, yeah. I wasn't ready. Um, to me, Easter is the day. <laughs> Is the day when uh, Jesus revived, and how I don't I don't know how to word it, but uh, revived and woke and conquered death. <laughs> Aubrey, 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 and Alexis, can one of y'all come up here? Come here, come here. Right. Brayla, you want to say something about it? Okay, Alexis, come on. Come on Alex. I'm talking about you. Come on, Alex. Come on. I was trying to say one. What does it mean to you? Uh, to me, Easter means like a new beginning because, of course, Jesus was perfect and everybody on the earth was sinners. So we really just got another chance to be like good people because Jesus was perfect and he's equal to us as people because, you know, he's perfect. So he died for us and gave us another chance. I was not prepared for this. Uh, this is Jesus is dying for our sins, like, so we can live eternal life with him. Yeah. Well, I feel like he's so, so, so these are our, what, we, what I call more my assistants. They're in the classrooms. They're listening to what we're teaching. And so they're a little bit, long, a little bit older, so they know a little bit more as far as that. And so this is my, my little preacher, my, my little praying warrior. Come here, sir. Come here. Yeah, I'm talking about you. Come on. Come on over here. My little praying warrior right here. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. What does Easter mean to you? Uh, it's basically like thanking Jesus for what he did for us. And one day he's going to resurrect. He's coming back to us. But for now, he's in our spirit. And he's always going to have a hand on us so he can do us right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. What, what, well, that's all I have for you all. Thank you so much. Be, hey, I want to ask this, though. Please be patient with us. We have to prepare some things for outside on today. So just be a little patient with us as we get things in order. We want the kids to have a great time, but we got to get our stuff in order. The day's kind of long. Don't mean to be that long, but, hey, we're going to try to get through it. And also, I'm going to let uh, Brother Richie finish us out. And thank you. Thank you. Actually, yeah, yeah. Hey, um, no, so actually real quick, I'm, I'm not giving the closing prayer to someone else. You, you can remain standing. But um, what you see or what you just saw is of greater things to come. I wanted to take a minute, though, to will y'all please, please acknowledge Brandon and Aranisha. Um, thank you. They were, they were specifically asked to, to, to kick off this children's church, and now you see why. All right. So, so y'all, let's not lose this excitement. Brandon, Aranisha, family, all of our young teenagers, thank you all for participating and leading this effort. I'm going to move out the way. I just wanted to acknowledge them. Yeah, I just want to remind everyone, next week, big week for us. This is Central Rock hosting our first Sunday fellowship. We're going to kick everything off that Saturday. Um, we're going to start things around 8.30. We ask you to be here at 8.30. We're going to have two breakout sessions. Then we're going to have, after that, we're going to go and do our picnic, kind of like a unity picnic thing. So we're going to feed you. We're going to kick it and everything and talk and build relationships right that Saturday. Then Sunday, that's here. Sunday, we will be at the venue at West Wind. That's over there in Mamel area, okay? So I, we're going to be there all day for morning worship and then, of course, for the first Sunday fellowship. So this is this coming up week. Show up. This is the time that we're hosting. We're inviting all of the sister congregations to come out. We especially need our own people, our own members here this Saturday at 8.30, we're going to go to 12.30, and then we're going to have some picnic and kick it and chill and, and meet the people from the community, okay? We're going to be feeding what? Oh, you're talking about where? West Wind? Yeah. Also at West Wind on, on that Sunday, that morning, so you won't go anywhere, we're going to provide a meal for you. Good meal, too. I know because we've been out of the money. So we're going to have a good meal for you. So after worship, we're going to eat that Sunday, and then we're going to go into our first Sunday fellowship. We're also going to have a little chew and chat if y'all want to participate in that, and we're going to have real talk about real issues that I will be hosting doing that for us or whatever. So we got a big weekend coming up. Please come out and be able to support. And I think that's all that we have. We're going to have you to close us out. Okay. All right, let us stand so we can be closed out, please. Everybody, please bow their heads. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us see a beautiful congregation of people as we learn more about your word. Thank you for just being there for us, putting a hand on our shoulders once we need it for more. And God, thank you for just making it Easter. You're coming back today, or if, whenever you come back, it's okay with us. God, thank you for this. Thank you for just being there for us. Thank you for giving us a roof, clothes, all of that, God. And thank you for just being you. In Jesus' name, amen.